Hi there. Hi. My name is VJ Daniels, and I've been asked to do a neurologic exam on you. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so the neurologic exam will often begin with sort of a general appearance, uh, overall GCS, mental status exam, which we're presuming is sort of okay. Uh, sorry, what was your name? Colin. Colin was able to answer my questions, seems to be talking. I would have gotten a lot more of that on the history. So we'll skip forward to cranial nerves. First cranial nerve is actually olfactory. If I had, say, some peppermint or coffee beans, I could test that, but I'm not so concerned about that. So moving on to cranial nerve two that has quite a lot of things that can be tested. One thing that we could test is visual acuity. So what I'm gonna get you to do is look at the door over there, okay? And what I'm going to get you to do is, do you see uh, the green line that's on the door? Yes. Okay. And do you see the red line? Yes. So actually, that's actually testing color. It seems to be okay. Can you please read the letters just below the green line? F-E-L-O-P-Z-D. -E. And I would continue on there. That's great. You can look at me now. If I want to do proper visual testing, I would actually measure the proper distance to make sure he was a proper distance away, and I would go through it a bit more systematically. But acuity is one of the things, and color is another, and those we've both done. Then moving on after that, another thing that we can do is visual fields. So I'm actually going to do the visual field testing with both eyes open, although one could argue you should do one eye at a time, depending on what the patient's coming in with. If it's a lesion that is pre-chiasmal, in front of the chiasm, you should do one eye. If it's post-chiasmal, like a stroke or cortical lesion, you can do both eyes. With both eyes open, I want you just to look at my nose, okay? Keep looking at my nose and tell me how many fingers I'm holding up. Two. One. Four. So I actually did both sides, because even though you could do each side independent, if he had a problem with a parietal lesion, he may have what's called neglect, where he actually doesn't perceive uh, the contralateral side to the lesion when both are presented, but that doesn't seem to be a problem. Again, continuing with visual fields, tell me how many fingers you're seeing. I'm putting my hands at sort of the periphery of my peripheral vision. One, two, ten. Okay, and I actually should have had my hands higher, but that's okay. So uh, visual fields seem to be good. Uh, the next part would actually be a fundoscopic exam. And uh, for sake of time, I'll skip over that, but that is technically something we should do as part of cranial nerve two. And then I'm gonna test the uh, light reflex, which involves cranial nerve two and three. So coming over here, again, just sort of look at me. And ideally, I'd like the lights maybe a little bit darker, but that's okay. Yep, and he does have a direct response and a consensual response on both sides. So that seems to work. And then we can do the swinging flashlight test. If we were concerned about a relative afferent pupillary defect, when I swing to that side, because cranial truve is not working, that side would then dilate, but he does not have that. Um, one other thing that we can test for is what's called the Argyll-Robertson pupil. Um, that will accommodate, uh, but will not react to light. Now, because this did react to light, we really don't need to test it, but if I were to test that and test accommodation, what I'd have them do is, can you look as far away as possible, look at the wall there, keep looking at the wall, keep looking at the wall, now look at my finger. And with that, I do see his pupils constrict nicely, so they are accommodating to near vision. So that's pretty much it for cranial nerve two. Then moving on to cranial nerve three, the key thing to test there is extraocular movements. And for that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have you look at my finger, okay? I want you to follow my finger with your eyes, but please do not move your head. And uh, please let me know if there's any double vision. So with these movements, we're doing the classic H configuration as that aligns the eyes, so it sort of isolates the muscles a bit better on the extremes. You may get a few beats of nystagmus at the extreme, but I don't appreciate that. Perfect. And did you have any double vision while I did that? No. no. Okay, so three, four, and six seem to be preserved. One other thing that can happen in three, if it was an isolated three lesion, is they can actually have problems where they can have ptosis of one of the uh, eyes, but I don't appreciate that. And they can also have um, some problems with the down and out eye and problems with dilated pupil and I don't appreciate that either. So everything seems to be fine with three, four, and six. Moving on to cranial nerve five, which is primarily sensation of the face. I'm gonna take a Kleenex here 
and I'm going to be testing the various branches of the trigeminal nerve. Can you please close your eye? And I want you to tell me when you feel me touch you. Yep. 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 Great, perfect. So I was varying the uh, frequency with which I did that, so he couldn't predict when it was coming next and varying the locations. Now, the trigeminal nerve does have a motor distribution to it, and that's the masseters. Can I just get you to clench your jaw? Good, perfect. And do it again. Feeling the temporalis muscle as well. Good. So that all seems to be uh, good there. And there is also a reflex that can be associated with that, and that's the jaw jerk. Can you just open your mouth very slightly, okay? I'm just going to put my finger there and just tap it. I'm looking for any sort of exaggerated response which there doesn't appear to be. And I believe you can see those in sort of bulbar palsies, uh, such as ALS. So that's cranial nerve 5. There is a reflex that involves 5 and 7, the corneal reflex. I won't actually do it, but I'll sort of demonstrate how one might do it. What I'd like you to do is look, turn your head that way. I want you to look up and off to the side. And so I do it this way. I'm not actually going to touch his cornea, but I take the Kleenex and I roll it up tight. And what I want to do is come in at, from the side so he doesn't see me, and then just touch the white of his eyes. And I should be watching both eyes as I do that, because that's the afferent, and if it detected it, both eyes would blink, and that's the efferent, that's cranial nerve 7. Perfect. You can look at me again. Okay. So that's cranial nerve 5. We've done 6 as part of 3, 4, and 6. Now moving on to cranial nerve 7. Now 7 is primarily um, a motor function, and there's actually five branches. What I'm going to do, I just want you to follow whatever I'm doing. Okay. Raise your eyebrows up as high as you can. Great, perfect. Now close your eyes so tight that you're trying to bury your eyelashes, which you're doing perfectly. Good, you can open your eyes. Puff out your cheeks like this. Good, I want to see it's even, and it appears to be even, perfect. Show me your teeth like this. Good, that's symmetric. And stretch out your neck muscles like this. Good, excellent. So everything seems to be in the five branches, seems to work well. One of the classic things we may talk about is a stroke versus a Bell's palsy. A Bell's palsy, because this lower motor neuron would affect the entire half of the face, meaning it would not spare the forehead. Whereas a stroke, as a cortical lesion, would actually tend to spare the forehead so we could still raise it up, and would mainly affect the lower face. And that has to do with having um, bilateral innervation to the forehead, so it tends to be preserved. So, uh, that would be cranial nerve 7. There are actually a couple other things one could test. It's actually 7 does anterior two-thirds of the tongue for taste. And actually, cranial nerve 7 actually dampens some of the uh, bones related to hearing. So people who had a Bell's palsy might have what's called hyperacusis, where they actually have louder sounds on that side, but something I wouldn't necessarily test. Moving on to cranial nerve 8, a sort of just a very quick screen, what I would do is i distract one ear by making this uh, with my fingers over the ear, and then I'm going to whisper into this ear, and I want you to repeat the what I whisper. Two, seven, two, five, seven, five. Okay, and then I'm going to do the same on the opposite side. One, nine, two. One, nine, two. So hearing seems to be preserved. He's not complaining of any hearing, so there's no reason to go on to a rubber or Renee's to do further testing, and that is cranial nerve eight. In terms of cranial nerve nine and and which are tested together, there's a few things you can do. I may not actually need the tongue depressor. I'll just get the light. Okay. Can you open your mouth? Okay, and say, ah. Uh. Ah. Uh. Okay. Yeah, I don't need the tongue depressor. I can see very nicely that his palate raises straight up and there doesn't speed to be any asymmetry. Can you again say, ah. Uh. Ah. Uh. Yeah, with the uvula staying midline. So everything looks good there. If there was a problem, the uvula may deviate to one side depending on where the lesion is. Uh, a couple things I could also do is I could do a gag reflex, but I won't do it. In fact, uh, a good percentage of the population may not have a gag reflex. But the other thing is I can ask the patient, could you say ka ka ka? So that's a palate sign and that seems to be fine. And just because I'm already doing that, I'll get them to say the other things. Say ma ma ma. ma, ma, ma. That involves the lips, so that's cranial nerve 7, and la la la. La, la, la. That's the tongue, so it's more cranial nerve 12. So that's 9 and 10. Moving on to cranial nerve 11, there's a couple things that it does, and the one better known one is the trapezius. So what I want you to do is shrug your shoulders up, 
okay, and hold it there. Don't let me push it down. Good, okay, and you can just relax. And the other thing that the cranial nerve 7 does is it actually does the sternocleidomastoid. Now, what's weird about 7 is it actually does the ipsilateral to the lower motor neuron nerve trapezius, but the contralateral sternocleidomastoid. So the way to test sternocleidomastoid muscles is turn your head slightly to that side, okay, and don't let me turn it back. Okay. And again, notice I'm not just pushing on the jaw, it's the whole thing. And it seems to be stretching there. And the other side, good. Excellent. Now you can look straight at me. Open your mouth, stick your tongue straight out. There's no deviation, there's no fasciculation. This is cranial nerve 12, good. I want you to push your tongue against my finger inside, yeah. Don't let me push it back. Good. Other side, don't let me push it back. Excellent. Okay. Um, and so that's cranial nerve 12. So that concludes the cranial nerves. We're now going to move on to the motor exam. And we're going to start with uh, uh, the upper limbs. Um, so for the, cranial, uh, for the motor exam, my apologies, there's really three things. There's inspection, there's tone, and then there's strength. And so for inspection, just looking at the overall bulk of the muscles, there doesn't seem to be any problems there. Looking for any atrophy, which would be t more of a lower motor neuron problem, and I don't appreciate that. And then checking tone. What I'm going to do there is just relax. I'm just going to slowly move your hand around. Just relax. Let it go loosey-goosey. Good. And just very slow, up and down. And then I'm going to go quicker to see if there's any catch of spasticity. Just slow and then fast. And then I'm going to move it around like this. There doesn't seem to be anything. Okay. And I would repeat it on the other side for sake of time. I'll skip that. Uh, tone appears to be preserved. Um, if he had spasticity, which was only on fast, it would be an upper motor neuron lesion. If it was totally flaccid, it could be a lower motor neuron lesion or actually a cerebellar lesion that could do that as well. So I've inspected, I've done tone. Now moving on to strength. I'd like you to put your arms up like this. So this is testing shoulder abduction, pushing down. Don't let me move you. Good. Okay, and you can relax. And that was preserved, it's primarily the deltoids, primarily C5. Okay, I want you to put your arms like this both up like that, okay? And don't let me move move it, so good. And don't let me move it the other way, excellent. Same on this side, good. And again, good. And so you can relax. So flexion was the biceps, C5, C6. Extension was the triceps, primarily C7. Can you put your arms like this, okay? So this is brachioradialis, sometimes called the drinking muscle, don't let me move it, which is again C5 and C6 but an important one because it's innervated by the radial nerve, unlike all the other flexors. Good, and you can relax. And then what I want you to do is cock your wrists up like this, okay, and don't let me move them. Good, wrist extension, sort of C6, C7, good. And I could do flexion, print it down like this. Good, that seems fine. And then put your fingers like this. And then this is finger flexion, which is primarily C8. Seems to be good, okay? And then finger straight out and finger extension, which I believe is mainly C7, maybe C8, and finger straight out. And don't let me close them together. I should do it actually at the thumb. And this, I believe, is C8 and T1. Great, and you can just relax. So that's most of the sort of key areas in the upper limbs for strength testing. I'm now gonna move on to reflexes. And so starting um, with the biceps reflex. And some people don't have the briskest of reflexes. Just relax there. And to bring it out, I can feel it there. I can feel the muscle. Can you clench your jaw? Clench your jaw hard. And that tends to bring it up a bit more. Good. And then the brachioradialis is here. Great. There. Great. And then the triceps. And there's a few ways to do the triceps. I'll do this arm first. Okay. And just let it drop down like that. Which doesn't always work for some people. Other ways, just, just let your arm drop, please. Let me hold it up. Good. Okay. There we go. Now I'm feeling it a bit better. There we go. Good. And those are the upper limb reflexes. Moving on to sensation. We've got a pinprick here, and I'm going to be testing the various dermatones. Again, it depends on what he's coming in with, would focus the exam. So what I want you to do is close your eyes and tell me when you feel it. Normally, I wouldn't go in this order, but I'm going to go in this order just so that we, I don't forget it. So this is C5. Yep. 
And sorry, open your hands like that. Good, and spread out your fingers. Good. Yep. Yep. See six on both sides. Yep. See seven on both sides. Yep. See eight on both yep. sides. Yep. Yep. And T1 on both sides. Great. So that concludes upper limb sensory sort of a screen. It could do other things as well, like proprioception or vibration, but depends on the stem. What we're now going to do is move on to the lower limb.